Hi everybody, Mr. Lee here. Uh, in this video, we are going to do the unit review for unit three. Um, that is the gravitation and rotational or centripetal motion stuff. All right, let's begin. So let's first start off with the, uh, the gravitational force equation. So we know that the gravitational force equation, no, oh, that's highlighting. Uh, the gravitational force equation, let me get this out is the F of capital G for gravitation is equal to uh, capital G, which is the gravitational constant, which is, uh, put this over here, I believe it is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, um, times mass one, times mass two, all divided by the radius squared. Okay, so with this equation, um, we're able to determine how attractive every single object is within our universe. So what that means is if we have a planet, let's say we have a planet, and we'll call that planet, I don't know, Earth, and that Earth has a orbiting satellite, which I don't know, let's call that the moon. I don't know where I get these names, but we have the Earth and we have the moon. Okay, And so the Earth and the moon, they have a distance that separates them, and that is the the r, the radius. And the reason why it's r for radius because we know that the moon uh, is currently orbiting the Earth. And so when it orbits, it creates a circular path. Okay, um, And so that's where the r comes from. Now, if you notice here, the r is in the denominator, and that's what we call the inverse square relationship. And so what that means is that the further away, uh, let's say we had a I don't know, a satellite all the way out here, right? So we have satellite number two. And so if satellite two is further away, we'll call that R2, the gravitational force um, that the Earth has on this satellite is a lot weaker. In fact, the relationship is a uh, inverse square that's weaker um, compared to the moon. And also if we have like, um, like our telecommunication satellite, like the stuff that helps out with your phone, right? That's a little bit closer to the Earth, and it's orbiting the Earth like so. So if we have something that is closer, the uh, the Earth exerts a greater force because of how close this satellite is. We'll call that R3, okay? And the important thing here is that if we were to create a graph of it, so F of capital G versus uh, the radius, okay? not radius squared, but the radius, we get a inverse line like so. I like that. So what this shows us is that if we have a very close radius, we'll call this R1, the force that is exerted is super high, versus if we have a radius that is super big, we'll call this R2, the force is super low. Okay, And it changes according to this, this inverse square amount. Okay, um, so that's the, the radius describing it, but this M1 and this M2, this just describes two uh, objects within our universe. Believe it or not, we can use this equation to determine um, how much force, like, I don't know, Neptune has on you. Yeah, you, sitting right there, uh, watching this YouTube video. Um, this because M1 would just be Neptune, the mass of Neptune, and M2 can be the mass of you. Now, the reason why we don't feel, we don't quote-unquote feel the gravitational forces of far, far, far objects is this R squared. Now, that's because Neptune is pretty far away from us. And because R is so great, this um, the denominator the denominator is so big, the gravitational force it becomes really 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 small. All right, now the what you need to know for the AP exam, um, more specifically for the multiple choice, is how to manipulate these variables um, to answer the questions. So what that means is usually they will describe the um, the weight that something has, right? Because if M1 is like the, the planet and M2 is you, right? The planet is pulling on you so that you will have a weight. Now, the, the problems that you might see is, let's say there is a object that had, that is two times uh, further away. So the radius is two, okay? Or we have a planet that is twice as big. So that's two times the radius. All right, and they're saying, how would your weight compare if you were on planet one versus planet two? Now I'm using a lot of words, so I'll just write it out. So let's say on planet one, okay, uh, if we just say G M one M two divided by R squared, okay, so that's what we're comparing uh, the weight to. So this is planet one 
and whatever numerical things that we come up with, this is equal to your weight. Okay? All right. And planet 2, if we say that everything for planet 2 is the same, okay, your mass is the same, the planet's mass is the same, except the planet has two times the radius. So we have two times the radius, and that is squared. And the question can be, um, how will your weight compare if you're on a planet with double the radius? And so if we take a look here, mathematically, we can figure that out because uh, we're not changing anything in the numerator. But here, we have two times the radius, and that two is squared. So that'll be four r squared. Okay, so this is what I need you to be able to see. Um, we know we can do some substitution. So we know that W, your weight, is equal to capital G, M1 times M2 divided by R squared. So if I take a look at this right here, I see W. I see W within G, M1, M2, and this R squared. So I'm going to substitute uh, this one fourth out, and I'm going to substitute everything else, and I'll kind of box it in or circle it in, right? That right there, kind of got rid of that 4, that is my W. So we get W times a fourth. So what that means is that on this new planet, uh, you will have a quarter of your weight compared to the old planet. And we could do this manipulation with any kind of the, the different change of variables that they give us. So let's try another one. So let's say we have planet 3. Okay, and planet three, uh, the mass of the planet, mm, let's say it's three times as massive. Okay, uh, M2 is usually you or some satellite. Um, and let's say, so the planet is three times, that ma three times as massive, and it's actually a third. Let's say it's a third, a third of the radius, a third of the radius, kind of like that. Okay, so we have planet 3. Uh, planet 3 has 3 times the mass, and it has a third smaller, so it has a third of the radius. Okay, so if we were to do um, figure this out mathematically, okay, we have, I'm going to go down here, we have uh, 3G, M1, M2. So all I did is I brought up the 3 into the front because I want all my constants out in the front, divided by, so one third square gives us a ninth. So that's a ninth radius square. Now mathematically, if you have uh, a fraction in the denominator, uh, what you can do is you can get the denominator within the denominator and put it into the numerator. So it would look like this, three times, so the, de the denominator within the denominator is nine, so three times nine, uh, g m1, m2, divided by r squared. So this gives us 27 g m1 m2 divided by r squared. Now if you remember, we said that g m1 times m2 divided by r squared, that right there, that is equivalent to w. So on planet 3, you would have 27 times your weight. And so when we talk about gravitation, oftentimes this is how uh, gravitation will be question for you, or uh, these are the kinds of questions that you'll see. The other kinds of questions that you'll see for gravitation um, is usually in terms of centripetal motion. So that's our next topic. Let's go into that next. So centripetal, uh, centripetal motion, if you remember, centripetal uh, means center seeking. Okay, centripetal motion means center seeking. So centripetal motion only occurs if there is uh, a object, or is it an object? An object? Yeah. A object that is moving along a circular path. Now, it doesn't have to be a complete circle, but it just has to be like a part of a circle at least. And what I mean by that is um, a problem that we did is, we like let's say we have a car, okay? And this car goes down a dip, and it goes up and above a hill like this. Okay, kind of like a roller coaster, right? So if you take a look down here in this first dip, this is like the bottom half of a circle, okay? And up here over this hill, this hill is the upper half of a circle. Okay. So, yes, these are complete circles, but because it's part of a circle, we can say that uh, the object that is moving along this bottom path right here and up and up over right there, it'll experience centripetal motion. Okay. Now, let's connect this with gravitation. So, let's say we have a star. 
right? Let's bring out, yeah, an orange. So we have a star, all right? And we have a planet. We have a planet right there. So we know that this planet will be orbiting the, the star. So because we are orbiting, we have this rotating motion or this uh, centripetal motion that's occurring. So the question is, is what is pulling this planet towards the star? Uh, what is causing this object to move in a centripetal motion? Because we know that if uh, the reason that it is moving within a circle is because there's forces, and we call that the net centripetal force, right? The net centripetal force. So if you remember from my previous video, the centripetal force is not a real force. It's the forces that cause the object to move in a circle. Um, and we know that this object is constantly moving with this tangential velocity, but it because it's constantly turning, there's a constant change in direction. Because there's a change in direction, we have what we call centripetal acceleration. And the centripetal acceleration always points towards the object that is rotating or the center of the circle. So I'll do that a little dot right there. So that will be the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so the object is constantly moving, um, and the velocity and the centripetal acceleration uh, is usually drawn as a perpendicular okay, uh, combo. So the velocity is always moving uh, in the direction that is moving, and the centripetal acceleration is always pointing towards the middle, and so oftentimes we get this 90 degree angle right there. Um, and just to let you know that uh, what this means is, well, let's do the force of gravity, right? Or excuse me, the gravitational force. And so the reason why this planet is orbiting the star is because there is a gravitational force, right? The star is pulling on the planet. And no matter where we are along this circle, the gravitational force will always be pointing towards the middle or, yeah, of the star, okay? And according to Newton's third law, um, if the star is pulling on the planet, the planet is also pulling on the star. And so if we were to, I guess, this is going to be weird, uh, but work with me here. If we were to do a reverse point of view, right? So if this is the planet and that's the star, right? We'll look something like that, where the star is like orbiting the planet, which is kind of weird to, to, to think about, but um, that's what we call the geocentric model. But we know we live in a heliocentric model where we orbit the, the star. But according to this, the, the star is attracted to the planet because of Newton's third law, right? All right, so the force of gravity is causing the net centripetal force, and the centripetal force will be the gravitation force, and it's always pointing towards the middle. So what this means is if all of a sudden we just got rid of the star, okay, and if the planet is right there at this location that I'm shading in, what will happen is that the planet will constantly will just move along the direction of the tangential velocity. Okay? And the reason why it'll move along this tangential velocity, when a straight line, by the way, is because there's nothing causing it to rotate. Okay? Same over here. If all of a sudden um, the star were to just you know, get erased, this planet would just constantly move along the path of the tangential velocity. Um, that's because of Newton's laws, right? A object in motion will stay in motion unless there is an outside force. And so what we're actually looking at is the second clause, unless there's an outside force. So the outside force is the gravitational force that's causing this object to not move in a straight line, but rather in a curved fashion. All right? Okay, so when it comes to working with the equation, uh, we know that because the centripetal force is a net force, we have Fc is equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration. And um, it's going to over here give us the equation for centripetal acceleration. It is the tangential velocity, tangential velocity squared divided by the radius. So we can rewrite this as mvt squared divided by r. Right? So this is the net centripetal force equation. Like so. Turn up the volume. If that's a net centripetal force equation, um, what we need to do is be able to determine which forces belong in this equation. And it's usually the force that is along the axis of rotation. So what that means is um, 
anything along the uh, the axis of the rotating object and the middle of the rotating object. So I'm going to do this in a different color. Let's do this in green. So right there, this green dot versus this green dot right there. Okay, if I were to draw a line between those two dots or those two circles, any force that is along that axis uh, is considered to be centripetal. And so in this case, the only centripetal force would be the gravitational force. So we could actually rewrite this um, to look like this. Capital G, M1, M2 divided by R squared is equal to MVT squared divided by R. Now, I want to quickly highlight right here this M. What is that M? What is that M? So if you think about it, centripetal force uh, is describing the rotating object. So this M is the object that is rotating. Um, and in this case, this would be the planet, right? So if I call this M2, because M2 is usually the object that is rotating, okay, we can rewrite it like this. And we can actually clean this equation up to look like this, because we have M2 on both sides. Uh, the M2s will cancel out, right? Because we can divide them out. And in the denominator here, we have radius on both bottoms, but this one has you know, radius squared, so there's two radii there. So I'm just going to get rid of one of the radii on the other side. So we get something like this, okay? And so this equation cleans up very nicely. What this shows us is that the tangential velocity of the orbiting object is dependent on two things. How far away, how far away, which is a radius, okay? How far away it is from the object that is rotating and how massive, how big. The, uh, the center object is, right? All right, cool, 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 cool. So that's how we can connect the centripetal force equation with the gravitational force equation. Um, but I wanna also point out different things um, for the centripetal force, like a couple more conceptual ideas. So um, let's see, if we have, let's say a object that is, I don't know, we have, we have a stick, and we have a stick and we have uh, we have a ball, right? We have a ball and a stick and we can kind of like twirl this ball around. So here we can say that this is the the tan or the tension because that is a rope, okay? And because this ball is whirling around in a rotating path, um, the question can be, you know, what is the centripetal force? So whenever you see anything that is angled like this, what you need to do, what you need to do is you need to be able to actually uh, break this uh, tension force down into its components. So we get Tx there, and we get, um, I'm going to do this in red, because this uh, tension is pulling up and to the left, Tx will be to the left, and this upward will be Ty, like so. Okay. Now, um, the way that it's, it's drawn, it's kind of like a little bit hard to see, but this vertical tension, it's not helping this object rotate around in a circle, okay? Um, and that's because only the, the Tx right here, this is the only one that's actually pointing along the axis of rotation. If this is the center of the rotation and this is the object, we can say that any force along this line Right there that I highlighted, that's what's actually causing the centripetal force. Um, and so we can even say that this uh, force of gravity is not helping with the rotation. Okay, And so we can rewrite our equation to look like this. Right? And then we would just solve it uh, according to, to whatever is there. All right, so we have things like that. Um, and another problem that uh, I often see is they will ask you what direction is the acceleration. So for example, let's say we have a roller coaster. Okay, we have a roller coaster like this. Um, and actually, let's break this one down. Um, we could break this one down even a little more. So we have a roller coaster, hello, right? And this roller coaster is gonna go up and over around this loop. So when the object is here at three o'clock, if we were to do the free body diagram, we can say that we have f of g, and we have the normal force pointing to the left, okay? And this is the center of the circle. This is the object right there. So anything along this dotted line right here is causing the centripetal motion. So we can say that at that point, the equation would look like so. 
It's just a normal force. The force of gravity is not doing much to help this object rotate in a circle. It's pulling it down, but it's not helping it rotate in a circle. And then um, if we look up here at 12 o'clock, okay, we can see that it's the normal force and the force of gravity that's pulling it down. So up there, the equation would look like this, f of n plus f of g. And the reason why both of those are positive is because anything going towards the middle of the circle uh, is considered to, to be positive. Anything going away from the outside of the circle is considered to be to be negative. Okay. All right. So with this equation, um, we can write this out a little bit more, vt squared divided by r. Okay. Um, the question becomes, does the person feel heavier when they are upside down here uh, versus, let's say, right here, when they're not upside down, okay? So if we were to take a look at this position right there, okay? Uh, the person has a normal force going up and a force of gravity going down. So this is something you should be memorizing. How you feel, okay, not emotionally, but like your weight, how you feel is determined on the normal force. Your normal force is your apparent weight. So if we were to create a net force equation, uh, in the vertical direction, so f of y is equal to f of n minus f of g. Okay, um, and we're not accelerating vertically, so all of that is equal to zero. So what this turns out to be is f of n is equal to f of g. So if I were to take this equation and put it into a sentence, I would say that the um, the normal force, how you feel, is equivalent to how much you actually weigh, which is f of g. And let's say that again, normal force, how you feel. Right, how heavy you feel is equal to how much you actually weigh, which is your f of g. So if we were to take this idea and we were to take a look up here, right, at the 12 o'clock when you're upside down, and we were to say to ourselves, well, how does this person feel when they are upside down? How heavy do they feel? And we take a look up here and we say, all right, if I want to know how heavy somebody feels, I have to figure out the normal force. So the normal force would be mvt squared divided by r minus the force of gravity. So this person would feel less than, less than uh, how they actually weigh. And we know that it's less than because we're subtracting, we're subtracting the force of gravity from the overall centripetal, um, from the overall centripetal force equation. There we go. I, I don't know why I can feel that. And so when you're upside down, the reason why you don't feel as heavy is because, well, one, you're rotating in a circle, but because the, the surface isn't really pushing on you as much. Okay, versus like, let's say right here, uh, you would feel just like normal, right? And um, so like just to wrap this uh, scenario up, a thing, a highlighted point that you should know is that when you are in like a loop-de-loop -loop kind of situation, the upside down, uh, whatever force is upside down, it feels less than um, the force of gravity, okay? Um, and in this case, both the normal force and the force of gravity, they're both centripetal forces because they're pointing towards the middle, all right? So I'm gonna do another sketch of this, but a little bit more cleaned up. So if I were to ask you, all right, so at position one, what are, how is this object accelerating at that instant? Okay, so if I were to say, what are the accelerations? Okay, what are the accelerations? Um, it's easy to point out, first of all, the centripetal acceleration, because, you know, I've been talking about that this entire video, which is towards the middle. But one other centripetal acceleration that a lot of people, or excuse me, one other acceleration that people forget is just your normal acceleration, which is downwards. And that's the acceleration due to gravity. Okay, so I wanted to highlight that, so don't forget about that. And if we were to look at the 12 o'clock position, right, we would have the centripetal acceleration going towards the middle and the centripetal, or excuse me, and the gravitational acceleration going towards the middle as well, right? So as you're, you know, coming across these new types of scenarios and situations, don't forget the, the units from before, okay? Uh, one of the very first things we learned was that the uh, acceleration to gravity always points downwards, right? Awesome. So we, let's see, can I think of anything else? Ah, the other scenario that I want to point out is uh, the bucket. So we have a bucket of water, right? So bucket of water there, I'll get my blue out. So we have a bucket of water and it's attached to a rope, right? And you swing the rope around in a circle, right? Wee, right, we swing it around. 
So as you're swinging around, the question B, uh, so if it's either here at 12 o'clock, at 6 o'clock, right? So it's usually comparing these two situations when it's at 12 o'clock or if it's at 6 o'clock. Uh, the question is, when will the rope uh, feel the most tension? Okay, so we know that the force of tension, it always pulls. So this rope is pulling this bucket up, and when it's above your head, the force of tension is pulling it downwards. So if the question is, when is, or at which location will the tension be the greatest? You have to think to yourself, um, when will the value numerically, when will all of the numbers be adding up? Okay, first is subtracting. So what I mean by that is, if we were to take a look at the six o'clock location versus the 12 o'clock location, uh, I have the force of gravity, and I have the force of gravity right there, okay? So if I'm taking a look at the six o'clock location, I have F of C is equal to M a C, which is equal to uh, positive T because it's pointing towards the middle, minus F of G because it's pointing away, right? And we're taking a look at tension, right? Because the question is, when is the tension the greatest? So we have M A C. I'm going to move the force of gravity to the other side, and we get something that looks like this. So what this equation shows us is that the tension force is equivalent to the whatever the centripetal force is, depending on how fast it's going, plus the force of gravity. Okay, so here we have two things that are added. Okay, and usually when we add things, um, the number becomes you know increased versus when we subtracting. So up here, if we were to come up with the centripetal force equation, we have uh, T plus F of G. And it's both are positive. Yes, I know it's pointing down, but both are positive because they're both pointing towards the middle of the circle. So if I were to rearrange this equation so that I would get T is equal to uh, MAC minus F of G. Okay? So if we were to compare uh, the equation that we just came up with, the centripetal force minus F of G is equal to T versus what we have down here, we can see that the tension at 12 o'clock is 12 o'clock is less than the tension at the 6 o'clock or at the bottom. And that's because here, the force of gravity is uh, subtracting from MAC. But uh, at the bottom, the force of gravity is adding to MAC. So if the question is asking, you know, at what point is it most likely to break, right? If there's a rope were to break, like if it has a maximum tension, we would answer that at the bottom. Uh, the, the rope is more likely to break because it experiences greater tension at the bottom, right? Awesome. Um, another thing that I want to point out is um, we haven't really seen many of these problems before, but you know, just in case it's there, uh, a question could ask, what is the minimum velocity uh, that you need for the bucket um, to travel one around in a circle, but for your tension to not feel any force. And so this is a cool idea. So if you, we, we've done this demonstration uh, as a class, but if you get the bucket and you're just swinging it around, right? At the top, if you slow down, there's a high chance that the object won't continue moving in a circle. And at the top, if you just slow down, uh, if you pay like close attention to your arm, you can feel that your arm isn't being pulled anymore by the bucket. And so in that scenario here, what we're looking at is what I just described. What is the minimum velocity that you need so that the tension does not exist? So that just simply means that this object is using its momentum to just move forward. Um, but we discovered that when we do this demonstration, you have to actually go fast up here in order to keep that rotating motion. But the question is, is what is the minimum velocity that you need in order for this object to keep on spinning? So if we were to take a look at the verbiage of that problem, all we got to do is we got to take the equation that I just boxed, okay? And for the tension to be zero, we just make the centripetal force equal to the force of gravity because this will just be zero. And we can figure out the velocity there, okay? And we can see that the minimum velocity that you would need, because the masses cancel out, uh, Vt squared is equal to Rg, and then we just take the square root of that, okay? And this is how we can figure out exactly um, how fast you need to swing an object in order for uh, it to, one, still go around, but then two, for the object holding into place to not feel anything.
Okay, so that's just a, a cool little thing that we can do. All right, um, the other thing that I want to point out before I close out this video is uh, if we were to take a look at the centripetal force equation, or more specifically, the uh, centripetal acceleration equation, we have Vt squared over R. Um, are the relationships that velocity has with the centripetal acceleration, okay? Um, because this velocity is squared and the centripetal acceleration is not, we can say that they have a square or a direct square relationship. Um, and so what that means is that, let's say, if this is our base variable, right, and we double the velocity, so we get AC is equal to 2VT, all of that squared divided by R, we can see that AC has to increase by a factor of 2 squared gives us 4, T squared divided by R. So whatever happens on the right-hand side, we have to make happen on the right hand, left-hand side. So we get like that. And another way to think about it is we know that VT squared divided by R uh, is AC, so we can substitute what I just boxed. Okay, so we get oops, so we get four AC because we can just replace everything in here with AC. So if we were to double the velocity, our centripetal acceleration would increase with, by a factor of four; it would quadruple. Okay, so that's um, another thing that they like to question you on. All right, so that's it for the centripetal motion. Um, review. Uh, make sure you don't forget about gravitation. There are a couple questions about gravitation. Um, I went into like how we can look at the, the variables and the variable manipulations because chances are that's how that's the kind of questions that they're going to ask you. Um, in the next video I'm going to go over the work energy power stuff uh, and I'll see you over there. Bye-bye.